Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm going to start with the seminar today. And the idea is to uh, present you some of the works that we have been doing last year related to coastal groundwater and coastal aquifers. And what I'm going to present here today is the Argentona Research Site. You know, it's a research site of the group, of the Groundwater Technology Group, where we are studying coastal groundwater. We have been working there for a while, and I'm going to present what we have been done the last years. And apart from that, I'm going to show you some of the geophysical works that we have been doing also last year in order to understand better the land ocean transition zone uh, through groundwater. So, as you know, all, of, all of you know, when we talk about coastal aquifers, we talk or there are two important com uh, components. One is the fresh water that we have inland, that is an important water resource, and it's affected for seawater intrusion. It's an important worldwide problem. And then we have the discharge of this groundwater into the sea. Okay, so when we talk about coastal aquifers or coastal groundwater, we work or we focus in these two components. As I told you, one of the problems is that we have seawater intrusion around the world. It's a natural occurring processes, but if human activities or human actions, we modify this equilibrium between fresh water and saline water, and we have this interface that moves along the aquifer. It's a problem that has been detected in all continents, even in Africa, but there are only a few studies because we are a lack of data but also is a problem taking place there. When we talk about submarine groundwater discharge, what's the point that all these groundwater have different nutrients, different solutes, trace elements that discharge into the sea and affect the environmental status of the coastal ecosystems. So it's important to understand what's happening here. When we talk, only for clarification and before we keep going, when we talk about coastal groundwater or coastal aquifers, we have to differentiate uh, different components or different parts. One is the fresh water, another part is the seawater or seawater intrusion. And when we talk about submarine groundwater discharge, we refer that of the water or meteoric water that is discharging into the coastal sea loss there was circulated seawater throughout the uh, geological matrix. So in this way, we define uh, this submarine groundwater discharge that is divided in two parts. What we call fresh, this part, or brackish submarine groundwater discharge and saline groundwater discharge. Okay? So in order to understand all these processes, we develop the Medistral Research Site. This is located, as most of you know, north of Barcelona. It's a relatively small area, full of borehole, different uh, studying methods in alluvial aquifer in the Mediterranean coast. It's important to mention that it's a microtidal sea. So the behavior of this transition between, or this mixing zone between fresh water and seawater, behaves different in some ways than open seas. And it has been a project that started 10 years ago with the collaboration of several uh, Catalan and international uh, universities and research groups. I'm not going to go into detail you know, this part, it's only to mention that we have this alluvial aquifer, about 20, 25 meters deep, this seal and some uh, layers, and this is around this 20, 25 meters, we have the uh, aquifer basement or the granite that has, has a semi-permeable layer. We have been this time, studying this for years. I'm not going to explain only to give you an idea about the uh, level of knowledge we have about this site. We have done a uh, long-term pumping test where we had to filter the effect of these small tides and uh, environmental effects on the seawater level in order to interpret the pumping test. We also have applied or studied the signal 
or tight signal into the wells in order to get some hydraulic parameters. Despite we have this, as we, we are in the Mediterranean Sea, we have a small touch around 25 30 centimeters. We see the effect in the aquifer, and we have been studying both uh, the data we can get or obtain from this information. We have also applied different uh, geophysical methods. Fiber optics, that instead of most studies that is located in the well, is located in the, between the ball pole or the tube and the geological matrix in the annular space. We have also installed uh, electrodes to perform cross hull uh, resistivity tomography. All these studies are uh, recently or published in the last years. We also used uh, fiber optics uh, as an active and passive monitoring. What means that? that we can use as an active way heating these fiber optics to obtain the groundwater flow along the piezometers and as a passive monitoring as you can see here in this small video to understand or to monitor at high resolution even 10 second resolution and high spatial resolution what are the changes in temperature underground and that is giving us information about the dynamics of this coastal system. This is an article on the preparation that will be published soon. In terms of hydrogeochemistry, combining different geochemical, geological, and even geophysical techniques, we have defined uh, the dynamics in some of the processes taken here. And with then member mixing analysis, we have defined the whole hydrochemistry of the system, all the reactions and uh, the reactive or the, react the, the reactivity that we have between the water and the aquifer matrix and even some expected sunlight and chemical processes. So, a lot of things have to, uh, were done, but then came Gloria Storm in 2020 and we lost the site, okay? This is an image of the site. We have one of the problems we have in this area. This is invited, uh, invited this species that covers everything and after the Gloria this is our research site but it's supposed to be our research site and even with all this vegetation we cannot see borefalls, nests or anything and many things okay most portals were nearly destroyed but every disaster is a new opportunity so what was the good point here that during the time that the site was uh, buried, the, 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 this Gloria affected the trend line, and then the government decided to increase this part here, get some land to the sea, in order to protect the trend lines. So what we did is to remove all these buried materials, all these sediments, try to recover the site, and drill some new boreholes in order to get higher resolution, the spatial resolution of the site. So this is the transition or the, pro uh, the profile that I've been showing you before. And what we did here is to build a new nest, as you saw before, several boreholes at different depths, and even another one here, a very shallow bore. And of course, we protected all boreholes and uh, we cleaned everything. So here, is the new site, okay? That was the historical one. And another thing, after all these works, is that drawing the mixing zone, something that we did, is incorrect. And this mixing zone that uh, depends or uh, affects the reactivity of the processes, the biogeochemical processes that are taking place here, cannot be drawn like this, but because it's affected, by the heterogeneities of the system of the sun, of sea layers that we saw before, are affecting the distribution of this mixing zone and the seawater into it. So we have this new site, or the, the, the improved site, let's say, with this new nest here, with shallow workholes here, with a similar geology, in fact. Okay? We repeat or we have similar distribution of geological materials, but very close to the sea. So with this new site, what we did also was to uh, invite new partners, so we started collaboration with new partners, and we started new sensors. 
What sensors? All of you know, we have the CTDs, the divers that monitor, or we can measure continuously temperature, groundwater level, uh, and electrical conductivity. We added two new sensors, and we are uh, monitoring also pH in order to understand redox uh, potential or the evolution of the redox potential in the site plus pH. Apart from that, one of the nests of the site has a live monitoring system, and that means that at any point we can go to internet and check what are the, the parameters that are sent, the sensors are measuring in that time. And that is very useful in order, for instance, to design the field work, the field campaigns, and to understand the, um, the uh, processes taking place in the aquifer. Another important thing is that this site is open for the SIS uh, community, not in Barcelona, Catalonia, Spain, but to the international SIS community. In fact, we have some visiting researchers from states last year. And the point is that we have been recording all these you know, water levels and parameters for, ten, for ten years, more than ten years now. So we have quite a lot of that. So this is one thing, new sensors. And the other thing is that, that we move sampling to the sea in order to, now that we have this nest that is right here, very close to the sea, we also sample at the sea. And we started collaboration with different research uh, groups of the Marine Science Institute. So we have here uh, people working in uh, coastal marine productivity, in microbiology, uh, in microbiology applied to understand, for instance, mercury degradation. So we have different kinds of experts here. And we did this new uh, field samplings. And you see, the problem is when you have a lot of people, is that you need uh, you have a lot of partners, you need a lot of people to monitor many things to uh, many bottles and equipment to get all the water samples you need. So we had two field we two field surveys and one of the things that we were paying attention is the chemicals of emerging concern that we have in these coastal aquifers or what is called from the oceanographic bibliography, what is called the subterranean estuary. That means this transition between the fresh water in the aquifer, mixing zone, and the seawater. Here, I only, uh, only will explain the main, uh, the main findings, but it's something that you can check and see in detail in a recent published article. So what are the chemicals of emerging concern? Is, there are, they are mainly everywhere, okay? Any compound that we have in many industrial processes. Nowadays, there are 144 million of resistant compounds, so that means a lot. And the problem that is growing faster that we can analyze it. And we have pesticides, pharmaceuticals, personal care products, so plenty of uh, compounds that goes into the environment, into the water, the aquifers, and of course, into the sea. So the idea was to see or check if we have these emerging compounds in the aquifer and what uh, if, if they change along the subterranean estuary and if we can use any of these compounds as a tracer of the uh, submarine marine water features. As they are anthropogenic compounds, maybe they can be used as a tracer. So what we did in order to test to analyze these compounds, it was uh, this work was done together with the IDAEA and we did non-target analysis, it means that we have, they have the reference standards for, in this case, for around 10,000 compounds, okay, and then what they do is, okay, we check this water sample and we see if we get these more compounds, these molecules in the water that we are analyzing right now. So, what we found, 92 chemicals detected in this, uh, in this aquifer, Related all these points, okay? Pharmaceuticals, biocides, PFAS. You now, if you know, it's what is called the forever chemicals because they are very difficult to degrade in the environment. Personal care products, plastics, benzos, drugs, many things, okay? 92 compounds. What is important here, if we move to the main findings, 
First of all, we found these 93 compounds. Even the, all of you know that the aquifer is a natural, uh, a natural filter. 93 of these compounds reach the last part of the aquifer before reaching the sea. So in this case, the target was 2,000, despite, as I said before, around 10,000 were analyzed. What is important here? From these 93, we found in the last samples, in the sudden samples in the sea, only 44. Okay, what means that? That more than half of these compounds are degraded in this transition zone between the uh, aquifer and the sea, and even the ones that were not uh, completely degraded, most, con most compounds show lower, uh, show lower um, concentrations. And eight of them, as the, we found that the, uh, were very persistent, we propose to use these eight compounds as a tracer, a new tracer, let's say, of HED when we find them uh, in coastal areas. So that's one thing. We have done also uh, other type of analysis. There is a lot of work ongoing. We have the typical hydrochemistry. Bella, this is your data. You have to work this as part of your PhD dissertation. Okay, a lot of work to do. And from here, I want to highlight only one part. Okay, we have as many other coastal aquifers, cationic chains, identification, and different processes. And in this, as part of this analysis, I'm collaborating with these new partners. We also work, or we are analyzing the bacteria, microbial populations, and all these things. So what we found here, that this is the fresh water, okay, chloride, conductivity, salinity, similar, and bacteria concentration or bacteria counting. What we found, this is fresh water in the shallow boreholes, but not the shallow west depths. These are the shallow boreholes closest to the surface, and then here we have the boreholes in the transition zone between the, uh, the, between the fresh water and saline water. So what we are seeing here, that the area that is close to the surface and the area where we have this mixing between seawater and, and uh, surface water, and, sorry, fresh water, we have the highest concentration of bacteria, indicating the potential reactivity of these zones. In fact, uh, last year, we published an article getting some samples of uh, the Medistra site, the Centona site, to analyze this bacteria. And what we show is that there is a high heterogeneity, okay, a lot of microbial populations making different actions, or pro uh, sorry, controlling different processes, and with an heterogeneous, uh, heterogeneous distribution along the site. So, what's the idea now? We are processing the data, but the idea is take all these new points, the shallow new workholes, the workholes in the transition zone, the one closest to the sea, okay, and see what they are telling. We have more detail into the system and even looking at the difference between different surfaces. We have one in the, uh, one in the wet season and one in the dry season. Are the same? The population, they are, have the same behavior, chemistry, they affect by the chemical process. Probably we will know okay, the coming months. Apart from that, we move to the transition zone. Why? Because when we look at this part here, nobody pay attention. As a hydrogeologist, usually what we do is looking the seeds from this side, and we focus in this part. Oceanographers do the opposite. They look from this part and they finish here. And as we say in Spanish, uno por el otro, la casa sin barrer. So we don't have information about this part here. Okay? When we have a look to geophysics, that even is more important. Why? Because when we do geophysical profiling, the highest resolution is in the middle part. So, if we have the sea here, when we perform land, in this case, electrical resistivity tomography, okay, what's the problem? We don't have information here. And when we move to the sea, okay, it's exactly the same. A lot of information here, but 
we don't have information here. Okay, why is it important this electrical resistivity tomography? Because this kind of uh, this geophysical approach gives us the resistivity of the geological media, electrical resistivity. As you know, high salinity means low resistivity, uh, low salinity, high resistivity. So it gives us information about the saline or the proportion or distribution of uh, between fresh water and saline water in the area. So how we did this amphibious profiling? Using two types of paper. One with um, graphite electrodes that we locate in the, in the offshore part or from the coastline to offshore because these kind of electrodes can resist the marine conditions. In fact, we started testing this with a land or terrestrial uh, cable and we could test once. After one test, uh, the cable uh, was gone. So the idea is that we can do this several times. We have this uh, uh, cable with uh, graphite electrodes and then we have this other cable as a, well, as a traditional electrical resistivity tomography. So what we do? We measure both at the same time as a unique line, okay, as a single line. What means that? We have got here the distribution of electrodes, okay, and what means that the higher resolution is in the middle part, where we have, or where traditionally we have got no data to understand what's happening here. I think that Jose Tour is, is listening, he knows very well this method. It has been developing that, I mean, nine years probably on how it works and how to do it properly. But here we have some of the initial results, okay? We did our first test in San Paul, here north of Barcelona. And you can see here, okay, this is the profile, seawater, underground, okay? And you see with these blue colors, it means seawater, and when you see the red colors, it's the non-saturated zone, okay? To give you an idea, when we have values above 2, okay, mostly these green colors, means that we have uh, brackish water, fresh brackish water, depending on the value, okay? This here is non-saturated zone, or sometimes we can have granites, okay, consolidated rocks. And the blue colors is the sea, or seawater underground. So what we saw here is some areas where we have this brackish water, which also this seawater intrusion going in. We had some problems to develop the method because when we were taking the measures, there were waves, the line was moving, so it was the first step, and we had to improve it. So what we did to improve it? One, is in order to see if this data is correct or not, we are also measuring uh, or getting information what we got, what is called the sea page meters. This is what you are seeing here. We put this in the sea bottom, okay, with this tube, with this back here. And the point is, is we have this chart, okay, if the water is moving here, it moved to this tube and it is stored in the back. So we can get information about the amount of water that is discharging plus the salinities of this water. This is one of, one of the improvements. <coughs> we located several of them from the geophysical profiling and we moved to an area that was covered to avoid waves and stuff, okay, in order to start or um, uh, to see if the matter was fine or not. So we did Another profile, a previous profile, and here we have even a nicer picture, okay, with these intermediate colors here, okay, brackish water, see what the intrusion, and the point is, okay, is this correct or not? If we compare with the data taken from the seepage meters, what do you see here? Salinity 38, 38, all these values are relatively high, okay, when we have this, okay, lower okay colors okay let blue green in this case the scale is a little different so close to seawater 
And then we have this orange here. Okay, more brackish water. And as it is where we find this salinity value of 30. So it's confirming that the values that we are seeing with this profiling are correct and that this method is a good approach to understand what's happening in this transition zone. We move to a karstic system, in this case it's in the rough, and here it's very nice, it's a karstic, we have these big conduits, and we have this big area of discharge, got some parts here, and when we compare with that, in this case not seepage meters, boreholes in the sea bottom, we see again that there is quite a good correlation between the resistivities that we see in the geophysical profile and the salinities that we found in the last meter or centimeters of sediment. So 34 with this green color, 37 in the transition, 33 again, 7, and here, close to this part, we have a big change moving to 18. So again, it shows evolution, and compared with sampling, the good thing is that you can go one day to the profile very fast, and see changes. And then here is a similar profile, instead of the one before here, we move a little, this is in February, and we saw two things. One, as you know, we are in a big drought, so what you see here is that there are less red, orange colors inland, less brackish water, more saline, and we also see here, okay, that these parts here, and it keeps so, it looks like that some marine groundwater discharge have some preferential path, probably fractured, we have to check the geology, that is affecting the discharge that we have. Remember that we are seeing this in 2D, but the reality is 3D. So, the idea is also to make or compare with different profiles. So, the last method, and if we move to the sea offshore, one of the things that I've been presenting before, is the continuous resistivity profiling. This is here is where we have the Mediterranean site, so the idea is to understand very well this area. This method works in a similar way, but the difference is that we have a boat and we move the line of electrodes along the coast or along the area where we want to study this resistivity or this uh, salinity of the groundwater in the sea sediment. So we have we also compare this with the divers. We need two profiles. This is the, what I presented one year ago in the previous uh, seminar. We focus in an area in the south, several profiles, different seasons, in order to check if the method was working well or not. We got very good results. Here is the land, inland, okay, offshore, and here is onshore. So we can see this area with higher resistivity showing the areas with brackish groundwater, and even we could see, by doing the same profile in different seasons, the changes in the salinity of the sea bottom. One important thing here, if you look, this is one kilometer. So many models, these things that we see in the books, show that the discharge usually is in the coastline. And what is showing is, is that this discharge is taking place Okay, along the sea bottom, even at one kilometer or even more from the um, uh, coastline. So, if it works for a, an intermediate scale, this is one kilometer, profiles of two kilometers, several, why not use or check it at regional scale? And what we did is to do profiling along the coast, now during this drought that we are suffering now, and if we go in more detail and we compare with the geology, okay, it's a different profile. The one before was perpendicular to the coast, and this one is parallel to the coast. What we can see here, all these blue green colors in this part of the profile, and these uh, red colors here. Okay, this is the sediments that we can we have in these alluvial fans that are in this case, you see the values. Uh, mostly we see water intrusion, but with a very small proportion of fresh water due to the drought. Okay, so the, the, the drought is affecting this uh, fresh submarine water discharge. And we also see in the bottom the effect of the geology. So if we move to the, oh, if we move to the south, 
we can see the granite basement, okay? Here we move to the granite, and we see that below these meters, five, 10 meters of um, sea sediments, we found the granite, okay? And what we have seen when we are going to this area is that the amount of the proportion or the distance of the submarine groundwater discharge and even the amount is high resistivity value change depending on the geology we have in the coast. When the granite is close to the sea, we have less discharge, less permeability, okay? And higher salinity is in the sediments of the uh, sea, uh, sea bottom. And in areas with more or alluvial fans or important alluvial aquifers, we have this submarine groundwater discharge reaching a longer distance, or oh, sorry, a distance farther from the coastline. And that's it. This is all of the advances, or at least a few of them. And if you want to make questions or discuss anything, uh, happy to answer. I did it short. Okay. <laughs> so. <laughs> Very, very fast, uh, a lot of things. <laughs> but okay, any, any questions? Yes. Albert, uh, okay. mm -hmm. first place. Um, so, I, I was wondering about this uh, when you mentioned the five, five like 90 something uh, how about the groundwater part, and then you found 40 something in the, in the, in the ocean. So, how, how, how far away from the coastline you take the, the sample from? Good point there, let's say. Okay, one thing here in order to, to see that or to compare that, we move to the side. We took samples here in the saline water part, plus in the seawater, very close to the side. If either, you couldn't see in the plots, but we took two samples. One around 20, 30 meters away from the coastline, and then one around 100, in order to see why. Because it is fresh water, at least in the shallow aquifer, discharge in this part. So the idea was to compare with it. But the other point is that so what's happening here. Another thing is where this degradation is taking place. Okay, if it's in the mixing zone, it's part of this recirculation, what would here, I mean, that's something to be or to have in more detail. One, we understand all the processes that are taking here, that we are not we are studying that. Not us, I mean the uh, coastal and water community. I think that someone sent some question in the chat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we don't hear the questions. Oh, <laughs> Jesus, did you hear them? One thing is, uh, for, uh, the, we, where we took the uh, seawater samples to do the to analyze the degradation of the, chemi the chemical emerging compounds. More questions? You have to speak louder. Okay. We have some theory or assumption that what what are the main uh, reactions that inflict in this degradation, you know, in the mixing zone? What would be the main reactions that affect this degradation? Of course, I don't know if they have some idea about it, you know. Well, well here, no, some of the, yeah, Xavi, Jesus, Paula, I think are the ones to answer yeah, better this question as they are been doing that for manager artificial Richard and uh, yeah, Martin here. Some, uh, contaminants and I don't know if you recognize that something is happening in the mixing zone. And we have many reactions there. If you show the evolved model we have many repetition, many of them. So I don't know if we have some very... the point is that all these are organic compounds. So the ones that are getting the grading, these are the microorganisms. And another thing is that uh, maybe some of them with these changes are fixed in the aquifer matrix. So that's another mechanism 
for what we can uh, take out or fix all this or avoid having these components to see what probably many of them are degraded by microorganisms or these biogeochemical reactions that we have in that. They cannot hear the question. Yeah, yeah. yeah Albert, yes, we, we hear you, Albert, this is Xavi. We hear you perfectly, but we didn't get the, the question. We got the answer to the question, so I think we can, <laughs> guess, we can guess the question. But anyway, if you want, I think Jesus has the same problem. Yeah, but now the, the, the question was, oh, uh, what is, what of the different reactions that take place in this zone are the ones that are degrading? the chemical of emerging concern. I well, think basically, you and uh, Jesus are much, uh, <laughs> have more much knowledge about the answer of this question. To simplify, to make it in a very, very simple answer, uh, it's sorption, the different types of sorption, and degradation. Yeah, that's it. So the breaking of the molecule, which is degradation, or just, um, let's call it plain sorption, so it's, uh, it's kind of a retention. And just to see the answer. Thank you, Charlie. So you have the answer of an engineer, sort of duration, and <laughs> from a scientist. Okay, fixing the quiffer matrix plus micro microorganisms. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, the answer can be really long. Eh? <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> and yeah. That's because and, they. they... Identify different groups of emergent contaminants in different zones. I want to put the graph that they made recently. So that was the reason that I was trying to figure out if you. Uh, I don't know if someone here. Yeah, no, you have yet to No, no, we heard. Uh, we heard, yes, you, you're right. There are different groups. And these different groups, uh, they behave completely. Well, actually, each, each compound is different. So mm -hmm. one of them, it also depends, for example, on the different redox conditions in the presence or absence of oxygen, if we are in nitrate reducing conditions, you get degradation and it's, I'm sorry, you get um, sorption degradation, which are completely different. So basically you have to study each component individually, even each metabolite individually. Uh, then of course there are too many and we, we cannot work with a million compounds. So we, we make groups or we, identify the most relevant ones and work with them. One of the important here, like which I say, is we have this set of redox states along this, you know, along the subterranean strike. We have, so it's as uh, they do in managed artificial research, we have it here, let's say naturally, where we have this transition or different redox zone along the, the mixing zone in the upper. And we know that this mixing zone is moving always, it's not... It, no. it's, it's moving, it's, uh, <laughs> it's different, I mean, it has a different effect for, for other contaminants, etc. And one more thing that we are just starting to see is the microorganism. Yeah. Okay, that the point is that, the point is that in this transition zone, the microorganisms that we have there are not the ones that we have in fresh water or in seawater, they are different. Yeah. So, Compared with, uh, for instance, inland groundwater, you have different kind of microorganisms. Okay. More questions online up here? Yes. No. So, one last question um, about the maize dioxide, because I see it seems to be like a, like a, a, a former river, right? It's like a, an old river. Okay, we feel a That's the right definition. Yeah. <laughs> okay, yes. So, so do, you, do you have some specific uh, nutrients, maybe, or something that is being transported because this was an old or ephemeral stream? That's uh, an important one. That's why I highlight the ones of the shallow workholes, okay? One thing is that here we only have water. It's a. Uh, 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 a disconnected stream, so it's not really a connection. We have only water after the, the big rain events, otherwise it's dry. Okay, here the uh, groundwater level is around three meters deep, or deep, but inland it's even five or ten in some areas, so it's disconnected. But here's an important, an important source of recharge to the aquifer is the water that we have in the surface. When it's water going down, when it rains, 
So what it means, not all the stuff that we have in the surface can move down. Here, for instance, Audrey, Audrey Sawyer, they came last year, they have been out from the States. Mm -hmm. He was studying or we were uh, doing to see how this groundwater changes and the effect on the, in the soil affect the release of carbon, uh, degradation process and all these things. So that's why I, I showed the, the, the concentrations or the value of bacteria. But what we see that the ones, the shallow work, these, these higher values are in the shallow workloads mm -hmm. and in the ones located in the transition zone. And the two areas with higher reactivity now. Okay. More questions? No?